Welcome to the latest episode of Ecosystem TV. I'm very excited to have Richard Howe, CTO of Kindle Singapore, here with me. Welcome, Richard. Thanks, Uli. Great to see you again. Richard, you can look back on 20 plus years of leadership roles in business and technology uh, from assignments around the world. What excited you about specifically Singapore as your newest venture? Look, uh, Singapore is a place that I've, I've really wanted to work for, for many years. Um, Singapore is a standout in terms of the uh, innovation and the environment that's been set up here, you know, particularly by the government. But you know, so many of the major enterprises are using this as a hub to really innovate. When we look back at your career, you, you know, you worked in South Africa, in the UK, in Australia. So this is your the fourth continent, you know, that, that you moved to. Why Singapore? You know, what was what nudged you to, to try something new and to decide on Singapore? Yeah, so I've been following, uh, I've been following uh, Singapore for a while, particularly in terms of fintech. Um, and I started to hear about what, uh, what was happening here, particularly with uh, MAS uh, and the drive uh, here to you know, really generate a lot of uh, new fintech products and so forth. And so that, that was what twigged my initial interest. Uh, so I started to, uh, to talk to you know, the folks inside Kindrel. Uh, about you know whether there'd be opportunities here, and, and I've been a technologist my, my whole life. I've I've uh, done roles, uh, engineering roles, architecture roles, and, and more recently CTO roles. Uh, and, and to me, it seemed like it, it'd be a great opportunity to come and, and work with clients here and really focus on technical innovation. Thank you. Richard. Can you um, you talk about Kindred? And uh, obviously, Kindra as a as a business is relatively new. Can you do a quick uh, elevator pitch on you know what what is yeah, what Kindra yeah, about? Yeah, sure, sure. So yeah, Kindra uh, was IBM. We were the services arm of IBM uh, back in November last year. Uh, we became an independent company. It's been an extremely exciting time for us. Um, we're roughly ninety thousand people globally, and we're growing. Um, we've brought with us over 4,000 uh, enterprise clients. We have 75% of the Fortune 100. Uh, we're very proud of our client list. We're very proud of the work that they do and the work we do to support them. Uh, we provide services. We're a service company uh, uh, across the range of uh, really the whole digital innovation range. So everything from cloud, uh, data, security, um, uh, really helping clients achieve what they need to achieve. And, and you know, we like to say we meet the clients where, we th where they are uh, and we take them where they want to go. You mentioned that Singapore um, presented a specific interest um, to you from the approach towards digitalization or digital transformation. You've spent a few months here now, you've met clients, you've met prospects. Can you give some examples where this is really coming out, the uniqueness of Singapore and how it's maybe comparing to you know, your previous roles in Australia or other geographies? Um, a couple of examples that come to mind about how progressive Singapore is. One of them is in healthcare and the other one sustainability. If I, if I talk about healthcare first, um, the Singapore One Health Program uh, is a fundamentally different approach to healthcare. Uh, and I think it, it may not be unique, but it's certainly very innovative uh, in, in uh, you know, when you compare it to other regions. And it's about wellness rather than sickness. But what the interesting thing that that drives is uh, a completely different requirement around the data that um, the healthcare companies need to need to have and need to uh, uh, need to manage. And um, you mentioned obviously healthcare is, is a huge topic, especially after after COVID, and um, you know a key priority obviously for for the government. You also mentioned sustainability, you know, and sustainability is coming up in a lot of our conversations today. What is your take on sustainability? Yes, sustainability is another one that the government's driving. Here, uh, it, it, they've taken a very proactive approach, and they're incenting the industries and the agencies here to be very focused on sustainability. Uh, that's right from an organisational level, but also down to the data level. You know, the, the and where we're trying to help is helping clients with the, the data challenges of where do they get the data for their sustainability? How do they report on the data? How do they secure the data that they need uh, for, for sustainability programs? Again, it, it's driving a fundamentally new and different requirement in terms of what enterprises need to need to capture. Richard, you bring up an interesting point. Uh, you know, Kindle and Ecosystem jointly did a research study earlier this year, and sustainability was covered in that as well. And specifically for Singapore, what we found is that 84% of organizations have sustainability on their strategy, on the strategic agenda. Yet when we look at how many have really embarked on this journey yet, um, it is a very, very few. So it seems there's high intent, but not much execution yet. 
Where do you see the challenges? Uli, you're absolutely right. Um, sustainability has become, a, you know, it's been talked about at the board level uh, now, and it's very important to enterprises. Um, they're making decisions that uh, the, their clients are interested in, um, you know, supply chain, and even their employees are making decisions about who they work, work for around uh, sustainability. Uh, it's still an emerging area for most companies. They have, they've normally set up their organisation, but the things they're struggling with is, how do they get the data? How do they report on the data? You know, to, to be a sustainable organisation, you all of a sudden have these obligations to um, report in a particular way, and often they don't have the data. They don't know how to capture that. And so where we're helping them is, how do you get the data framework right? Um, that you can collect the data, manage the data, and then report on the data. So I think a lot of these companies are still very much on that emerging um, journey about how do they get from the boardroom idea and the policy idea to the tangible execution part of the sustainability. Your healthcare um, example, as well as sustainability, it seems to be coming down to data. You know? But then um, every organization that we talk to seems to be struggling with you know, managing the data, really driving value out of that. Can you share an example or you know, maybe an organization that you've worked with where they really had a, you know, a, a good approach or an entry point on how to tackle this challenge? Yeah, yeah thanks, Uli. So, yes, the, I'll use a healthcare example. We're working with uh, clients here in the healthcare industry uh, around the data uh, challenge. And, and I come back to One Health uh, as an example. And the entry point, I think, is, you know, particularly with healthcare data where it's so critical, you start by looking at uh, protecting the data. And so the organisations look at their data protection policies and their technology. How do you tokenise that data? How do you mask that data as a starting point? And you can imagine with healthcare, it's, it's absolutely critical data. Then they look at how do they actually assemble the data because most of these organisations have you know, vast you know, data sources inside their organisations but they're not assembled in a way. So then looking at how you create data lakes with, uh, by bringing the data into a central and most clients are, are choosing cloud uh, to, to do that. Some great um, you know, data lake products uh, that we're helping clients with there. So data protection, then you know, assembling the data. And then the next thing is, is actually in getting the insights out. And so they then start to focus on AI, ML, data science to really you know, generate what they need to out of that. And when you think about the One Health program, where you're going from uh, trying to get insights about people's sickness to trying to get insights about people's wellness, uh, it fundamentally is a different way of, of um, you know, tackling the data problem and the different kind of data science and data analytics that you actually need. So we're helping clients work through that journey of how do you, how do you assemble those things to come up with the insights that you need to drive a wellness program. So I've been following data management for a long time. Actually, I started as an analyst, um, you know, covering that space very closely. Uh, but at that time, it was all about reporting and driving value out of the data that was an output from, from our operation. Today, the discussion has changed that we're driving value from data as an input into our operation. So, you know, automating processes, uh, driving customer experience, uh, you know, defining what products we want to offer to our clients. So that requires a very different approach to the data framework that we create in our organization. So what is your take on this? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, again, in terms of setting up a data framework, there are a couple of key things that we advise the clients to really focus on. One, one of the challenges that clients have when they're assembling a new data framework uh, environment and they're dealing with new data is how do you do it in a way that it is highly secure, um, but you're not spending a fortune actually managing that data. And so we focus on two things. Uh, one of them is you know, the risk profile, and the second one is obviously the data framework. And as you're setting up your new environments, you need to think about how do you automate those things? Um, you can't uh, you know, have a team of people tagging your data, determining what's PII, what's, you know, what's critical, what's non-critical. You need to be able to do that in an automated way. So part of the advice that we give is about how do you establish that so that you end up with a highly secure but very efficient way of assembling, assembling the data. Another point that uh, is coming up in a lot in discussions is um, we're talking a lot about innovation at the edge. You know, we're talking about AI, we're talking about machine learning, uh, edge computing, uh, customer experience. Um, 
So that's all uh, you know, fancy innovation that is happening uh, you know, at the front end. But when we look at our research findings and we ask organizations, what is your number one priority for technology for 2022? It is not the fancy stuff, it's infrastructure modernization. Have organizations understood that to do all this great new innovative stuff, you need to get your core right or why do you think that is? Yes, Ulio, I to totally agree. I think for the clients to really generate the insights out of the data, you have to get the base right. Uh, and that's why so many clients are actually focused on building new platforms, moving data out of their old environments, moving off the old infrastructure, typically into cloud environments, so that they can make that layer invisible. And then that allows the businesses to focus on what the business is doing, and that is generating insights from the data. But you have to have a solid base that is secured, well automated uh, and, and well controlled. One other point that I just quickly want to throw into the conversation as well is talent. Now we're looking a lot about new technologies. You talked about, you know, cloud. Also, we're talking about, uh, you know, new ways of API architectures. We're talking about, you know, microservices. We're talking about all this fancy stuff um, at the edge. When you talk to your customers and prospects, like, how do they resource that from a talent perspective? How do they manage? Uh, their environments, not just what they have today, but also what they, what they want to build in the future. Yeah, I, I think the trick is you, you need good partners. Uh, and and what, we, what we try and do is we bring in the best tech and the best partners that we can find to help clients solve their problems. Because no enterprise today uh, can employ all the people that they need to, to, to get the innovation they need. Uh, so it's going to continue to be an increasingly difficult um, situation. And what we do with, with, our, uh, with our stuff is we're very much focused on you know, continuing to develop the talent and the skills within the organization as well as, as hiring so that we can help the clients and then we partner where we need to. But I think partnership uh, is the key if you want to bring the best tech together. No, thank you, Richard. I think it's uh, very exciting times ahead. And um, when we talk about talent, just one uh, personal question. Um, I know that you've got uh, a couple of sons um, you know, left, left, left behind in, in, in Australia. Do you advise them to go into technology or would you say, look, choose, choose a different career path? Yeah, d d despite my advice, they've both gone into technology. They both work for IT consultancy companies. So, you know, maybe one day I'll end up working for them. Who knows? But uh, yeah, so they, they uh, stay behind in Australia and uh, they seem to be very excited about me coming to Singapore, almost as excited as, as I was. And it may be because they're still living in the house. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm pretty sure they're having a good time. Look, thank you very much for joining us here on Ecosystem TV and um, all the best for your new role at uh, Kindrel as a CTO here in Singapore. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Julie.